Hello everyone and welcome to episode 276 of the MTG Goldfish Podcast. I'm Seth, probably better known as Zephron Olive, and we have the full crew here this week, starting with the owner of MTG Goldfish, Richard. How's it going today, Richard? Hey, Seth. How's it going? Uh, it is going well. We have a couple of uh, interesting topics to talk about today. But before we get to that, we got another co-host in Krim. What's up today, Krim? Hey, Seth. Uh, you know, no, a, a lot a lot of things, but yet not a lot of things at the same time. <laughs> uh, so this week for our cast, it, it's kind of a weird week. We don't really have a ton of tournament news, but we have a couple of things we want to talk about. So we got the full announcement for Historic Anthology. 3 with a bunch of new cards coming to Arena. So we want to talk about that. There's been a really interesting uh, Twitter conversation with Mark Rosewater, the head designer I think his title is, at Wizards asking some questions about Ikoria that we want to talk about, and then of course answering your fish mail. So that's kind of the overview for today. But before we get into it, a reminder that once again our show today is brought to you by Spikes Academy and Spikes Academy recently launched a new control course with Corey Burkhart. So if you like me making your opponent's lives miserable with counter spells and card advantage. This is the perfect course for you. You can check it out now at spikesacademy.com and learn from the best players in the world. So thank you to Spikes Academy for supporting the show. And with our sponsorship stuff out of the way, let's talk, uh, let's start with historic. Let's talk historic anthology. So we got the full spoiler, I guess, 27 new cards that are releasing 10 days from now. I think it's May 21st. So what are we getting, uh, Richard, in historic anthologies? All right. The full list is on the website in case you don't know what some of these cards do, but we'll go over them quickly. So Akroma's Memorial, Ancient Ziggurat, Body Double, Chainer's Edict, Devil's Play, Enchantress's Presence, Gen Palm Incinerator, Gen Palm Polluter, uh, the full Honden Cycle, (laughs) uh, (laughs) Curls and Tusker, Momentary Blink, Maze's End, Mirari's Wake, Ratchet Bomb, Roar of the Worm, Silent Departure, Swan Song, Timely Reinforcements, Tectonic Reformation, Tempered Steel, Unburial Rites, and then, of course, our two previous ones, Ulamog, The Sleetless Hunger, and Phyrexian Obliterator. Well, I, I mean, Seth, you probably know how, like, that I'm probably pretty excited for Jim Palm Polluter. Like... <laughs> I, I, yeah, I mean, yeah. Gem Pop for Looter is definitely sweet. Yeah, like, Gem Pop for Looter sweet and Incinerator could be fun. Then, I don't know, like, I, I was kind of caught off guard by randomly Chainer's Edict when you also have Liliana's Triumph in standard, right? Or, I, like, in, in, in the format, because you could play it at instant speed. So, like, personally, I feel like some of these were kind of like a big miss. Like wow, okay, I, okay, I, I can, I, I can see that. I guess it's not what you were expecting, basically. Yeah, like I was really excited, and maybe maybe it's because I got my hopes up uh, with like when you when you open with Ulamog and Phyrexian Obliterator, right? It was like, yeah. whoa, <laughs> this is what we're opening with. This is the opening band. What about the closing band, right? So, <laughs> so like, of infinite rage. <laughs> yeah, what a closer! <laughs> like the Honden cycle, kind of random. Uh, I, I feel, I feel like Wizards is trying to put throwbacks from other formats <laughs> into historic anthologies. Like I see Commander Staples, which I'm not sure. Like, are, are we really gonna play a Chroma's Memorial in historic? Uh, uh, we have Chainer's Edict from Popper, I believe. Uh, you know, we just have like kind of like throwbacks from random formats to maybe entice people to play historic or from historic entice them to play the other formats. I, I, I guess. I mean, like, that's fine, right? I mean, I'm not, I'm not surprised that they like, like, you know, threw in some random cards because like it's a, when you look at the cards like that are legal in historic, sure, it's like, oh, whoa, that's in this format. Why? But like, I mean, Okay, I'm a little bit concerned about this, but, like, do we need Maze's End? Like, Ramp is really good, right? And already, like, the, like, Ramp's got a lot of stuff going on for it. So it's like, well, what are we, what are we gonna make? We're gonna make more Ramp. (laughs) So, like, more Ramp, like, things, like, for Ramp. And that is a little concerning. Uh, but, I don't know. I mean, 
I guess on Barrel Rights is pretty cool. Ulamaga Suite, Obliterator, Gem Palm Polluter, right? Those are cards I'm really excited for. The rest, I don't really... I, I, I don't know. I mean, Swan Song, sure, that's cool. But like Ratchet Bomb, what does that do? It's a catch-all so, answer, Crim. <laughs> <yeah>, ah. <laughs> so, so looking at these cards to me, I feel like... I feel like they actually make sense based on what we've seen, uh, for the most part, what we've seen in past historic anthologies. It seems like Wizards has tried to have uh, historic anthologies kind of build on recent themes and standard sets. So we got like a lot of enchantments in Theros Beyond Death. Enchantress's presence is one of the better enchantress effects you can play. So that powers up like Theros Beyond Death stuff. We just had cycling return in Ikoria. So we got a bunch of cycling stuff. The weird one for me, uh, and going out on a little bit of a limb here is flashback. I'm going to say that flashback is going to be returning soon. I don't know why else you would have all these flashback cards unless maybe that's a returning mechanic in course at 2021. Maybe it's like foreshadowing what's to come because there are a lot of seemingly random flashback cards that otherwise, I don't know why you have like so many flashback cards in this set. So I don't know. I, I'm pretty fine with it. Obviously, the rest of the cards are not on the level of, like, Ulamog or Obliterator in terms of impact, I don't think, to the format. But I don't know. It seems like a, a reasonable set of cards to me. I got an answer for you, Seth. They wanted Unburial Rights in Historic Anthologies 3. And they're like, well, now we have support for Flashback. What should we do? And they just <laughs> added some filler Flashback cards. I don't I don't know if this foreshadows the return of Flashback, I, I think. <laughs> They just wanted a burial rights, so and they're like, well, we'll just Seth. add some other cards at the mechanic. Why not? <laughs> I'm going to throw you a curveball. They wanted Roar of the Worm in the format, so <laughs> that's why they brought it, and then everything came with it. No, no. Like, I I don't know. Like, I mean, I get it. Like, I wasn't expecting Snapcaster or anything with Flashback, so that's fine, right? Like, I get that. I, 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 I like Tectonic Reformation. I think that could be pretty cool. But, like, I... Uh. You know, excited for timely reinforcements, like Not, the most does aggro, card ever for aggro. <laughs> does aggro even exist? It, it like it's grawl, but like if I'm playing against grawl, like a single spellbreaker is better than like all three of those tokens, <laughs> right? So, like I don't, I don't know. I mean, I the 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 polluters are like the gem palm cycle is the only thing I'm really excited about outside of like obliterator. And unburial rights. Ulamog, I'm very concerned about because now I just see like, okay, well, Ramp's getting more stuff. And well, you asked why there's a Chainer's Edict. You need a second sacrifice oh, effect to take right, care of these Ulamogs, right? Right, 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 right. right. <laughs> you know, I have to have seven mana for that flashback part, right? What if they exile my lands? <laughs> I. I gotta say, it's pretty funny how quaint Marari's Wake looks these days. When it's oh, like, yeah. you look at that, and that was like was such a powerful card in the past. And then when you think, oh, like Nissa just doubles your mana, it does stuff right away, or like Fires of Invention or Wilderness Reclamation, which are like cheaper and immediately give you mana. You don't have to like tap out and wait a turn to double your mana. It's kind of funny, like how bad Marari's Wake looks for a card that was pretty exciting uh, in its time, like 20 years ago. Have people played this in like. Constructed standard. I mean, uh, it was expensive when I was younger. That much I remember. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm pretty sure that it was played in a uh, index back in its day in standard or extended. But I, I could be wrong. That was a little bit before my time. So I'm going by my like remembrance of stuff that happened before me. It definitely, even like for commander, it's not. I don't know. It's just like seems so bad compared to our current mana doublers. Wait, I will say, in commander is so good, <laughs> but in standard, <laughs> it's so bad. Uh, I also think Enchantress, uh, Enchantress's presence might be a little bit weaker nowadays than what it probably once was, right? Uh, like, but what if you followed up with five shrines? I mean, yes, yes. What if I, like, okay, the dream curve of, like, Enchantress's presence into, like, maybe Fires of Invention and, in in, like, I don't know, a random haunted <laughs> shrine or whatever. Like, that, that's, that's pretty cool. But, like, I don't know. I mean, it just, it, doesn't that seem a little bit weaker to you? Than it, than it, I mean, it's still staply of legacy uh, enchantress. Like, it's still still one of the enchantresses they play there, and they have access to like every enchantress effect 
in the game. So I, I think it's actually really good. I think the but, power of it is it's an enchantress that doesn't like if enchantress is period or bad, then enchantress's presence isn't going to save them. But if enchantresses are good, I think this is better than uh, whatever Satessin champion or any of the other options, just because it's a lot harder to kill. Yeah, it is harder to kill like you like usually. But I mean, like the game plan, right, of like just Playing an enchantment, like, I, I'd rather have a Satessin champion because I know it sounds weird because though it's easier to kill, I can actually, like, hit somebody with it. And I really can't let, like, Nexus of Fate decks, like, sit around, right? So, like, if I'm trying to outvalue them, th- that's that's great, but I may never get a turn again, right? Like, so, <laughs> so you all, know what I mean? All the, all the Hondins in the world are not going to save you from a Nexus of Fate. <laughs> exactly, because it'll never be your upkeep. So... <laughs> I don't know. I mean, maybe that's that's why, like, I, I've just, like, there's a lot of these cards that, unless they start, like, banning some of that stuff, like, and removing it from the format, I, I just, like, the only thing I see that matters here that could be relevant is, like, Swan Song <laughs> and, and, like, Ulamog exiling their lands and their, you know, like, whatnot. But that means you're, you, like, there's the chance that just the Ulamog decks also just randomly play Nexus of Fate. <laughs> I think the other thing is we have a jumpstart coming soon too. So we're going to get a shake up there. So maybe, maybe they went a little bit lighter than normal with this set as far as like really push cards because they know we're getting a bunch more cards in the format in the semi near future. Maybe, yeah. maybe, yeah. maybe I'm grasping for straws, but like, but this is just my opinion, right? I, I, I felt like this was just, I was, I, 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 once again, maybe just because I thought like the last couple of sets we're like they nailed it, right? They added, like hit it out of the park. Uh, it was great. It was in, it was exciting, and you know, like these cards kind of just are okay to they're okay to oh my god, Ulamog. <laughs> like right, like, <laughs> all right, Crim. Right, I'll put you on the spot. Name three cards, or I'll, I'll give you an easy one. Like three cards or three archetypes you want supported for the next historic anthologies. Literally a better removal spell for Ulamog that isn't going to be f- four mana. Um, uh, and, like, on top of that, I thought it would have been really cool, like, if we had the, like, Thalia, Cathars, what, the three mana one from Shadows or Eldritch. Uh, Heretic Cathar. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I I think that would have been great. Uh, or maybe a little more, I don't know. Like, they did some tribal support with the gem palms, but, like, tribals that I was not expecting. Um <laughs> And I, I thought it would have been pretty cool. Yeah, just like even like a Thalia's lieutenant would have been pretty cool. But like, I guess that might be too powerful. I don't know. So, so you want human? So uh, yeah, like Pat to exile Thalia's lieutenant, and then like, the big yeah. Thalia get get some white weenie going. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like and and then of course you know I I know Amonkhet remasters is coming, so that's gonna be pretty cool. Uh, some uh, or or like some kind of remastered version of it. Uh, but like yeah, like just. More efficient, like, sweeter answers, um, sweeter, like, some more, like, tribal support to, like, support the cards that were previously dropped. Like, even a, a, a uh, what is it, Master of the Sea or Lord of the Trident or whatever, the more... Bur- <laughs> None more- of these are right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Grim is really bad at naming tribal yeah, cards. <laughs> I don't remember, like, like yeah, like... Lord of the, Atlantis. Lord of Atlantis, and then whatever the other one is, the, the other Master, lord. Wait, what is the other one? Ma- something Master, in the Pearl Trident. Is it Master? Master. Of yeah, the yeah, 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 yeah. There we go. <laughs> same, same thing. <laughs> and, you know, if we're already, like, in the ballpark of, like, what Theros just recently dropped, like, Master of Waves, that's kind of, like, a, a nod to it. Like, I mean, you still have Blue Devotion from Theros Beyond Death. Now you can just like have more things to do with it. I don't know. Like, there, like there's a few things. Like, even I really wanted the dragons uh, of Tarkir cycle of commands. Um, but Ooh, like, okay, because I think that would have been fine. And like I, be, I said it before. Even like Tarmogoyf, I think would be pretty cool. I think the other thing I will say about these cards is they're they're mostly older cards, which I feel like maybe part of the reason for that is. Wizards is expecting to uh, backfill through Pioneer with, like, the remix sets and stuff, so maybe they're, like, trying to focus on cards that they won't be putting into the format through remix sets in the hopefully not super distant future, because if you look at these cards, most of them are not Pioneer legal. Like, yeah. I know Ulamog is, um, but that's that's pretty close to that. I, might, I guess Maze's End is also on there, but most of these are old enough that they won't 
naturally end up on arena through the remix sets that they're doing so that might be part of it too like maybe with the like the command cycle they're like well we're gonna do whatever dragons of tarkir remix at some point so what's the point of like releasing it in an anthology yeah i mean like i i get that because like also like there's well they don't want it to be pioneer right they need to differentiate it from from like from that format and it and it's not modern right so i i feel like i, I get what what they want to try to do with it but like i still feel like there's just like better things like maybe not right now as i like like what what i would choose is like i don't know there's just stuff from all over but like th- this this set just kind of was not like the last two for me so i don't know but that's just my opinion so we need force of will no force no no will, we please. don't we don't we don't need that as much as i love Strip that mine <laughs> blood moon force of will come on wizards <laughs> oh yeah like something to punish ramp would have been great you know, once again, like if, <laughs> any, like anything at all, like burning earth, even. Uh, all right, so that's historic anthologies. Let's uh, let's move forward and talk a little bit about these Mark Rosewater questions. So uh, there's been, I don't know, a big hubbub about companions on social media recently, which you probably know we've talked about it before. But the interesting part of this recently is Mark Rosewater has posed some. I think pretty uh, interesting questions on his Twitter, uh, and I think it might be fun to talk about them a little bit. So, Richard, uh, what did uh, what did Mark ask on Twitter this week? All right. Uh, so first up, there's a poll on Twitter. Inquiring minds want to know: While R and D tries to support innovation and balance, the two often fight with each other. Which of the two do you personally believe R and D should prioritize: innovation or balance? Oh man, I mean. I, I know the the answer that everybody wants is both, right? But if I if I'm just going to answer Mark's question, I'd probably go with innovation. Yeah, I feel like people <clears throat> people some people said both on Twitter, and Mark was like, "No, like that's not the point of this." Yeah, like, I, I'm asking like <laughs> if they're in you know competing with each other, and I don't know like. I do kind of think they're like separate things, so it's a little weird to me that you view them as competing. But I think. <sighs> I don't think innovation has much value without balance. Like innovation without balance leads to uh, an unplay game, uh, unplayable game of magic. Balance without innovation probably leads to a boring game of magic. Uh, so I think you do need both. But I think if you really do have to choose, I think long term the game is healthier if it's balanced and less innovative than if it's innovative but not balanced. I mean, yeah, I would say the opposite. <laughs> I mean, I, so I agree with Seth. This is a loaded question because you actually do need both. Um, but uh, if you had to choose one, it has to be innovation because we're, we are not chess. Like we don't play the same game over and over again. If it was perfectly balanced, like you could do this, right? If you thought Cobblade magic was the greatest magic of all time. It was. Nothing stops you <laughs> from playing it right now, right? Nothing stops you from resurrecting m13 standard or whatever you felt was the best standard and playing it forever with your friends right so we do need innovation but i do think it's a poor excuse to say you can innovate and then because we innovate we're allowed to just break everything it's like you just can't have scientists going off and creating like zombie outbreaks and apocalypse (laughs) it's like no right like yeah we need innovation but like you know, we need safety and you need procedures to not, like, destroy the world in this process, right? So I, I, I would prioritize innovation, but I think it's an excuse that you can't keep the format balanced, right? Like, the mistakes should be small and not catastrophic, right? You shouldn't, like, break every format simultaneously within a day. That's a bit catastrophic. <laughs> but, like, you know, I don't know, like, Siege Rhino slightly OP for a couple months. Okay, fine, right? Like, so I, I do think there there is some... Uh, gray area there. It's not all or nothing and, you know, we can be more balanced while pushing innovation. As far as the poll itself, it was uh, 58% for balance and 41% for innovation, although... I would expect if uh, Mark Rosewater asked this question like a year ago, it probably would be much more in favor of innovation. I think I think a vote for balance was a vote against companions for a lot of people. So I think that yeah. like asking the question now, I think almost guaranteed that balance was going to come out ahead where in a more like stable period of magic, I think players would have probably went more towards innovation. And like, I, I know that this is circled around, but I feel like this is a... Uh... <laughs> This is uh, all, all these sweet new cards and, and like, you know, game-breaking cards is a response 
to the amount of like sadness that was going on during Ixalan, right? Because everyone's like, dude, this is the most boring thing ever, right? It's so safe, this, that, right? Like, I mean, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> I thought, I thought that like, like that, that set and all of that was just so safe and like, like I didn't like Magic then, right? That's actually when I wasn't playing as much, uh, or at least not standard, uh, because like it was, it was too like I. <laughs> I like companions, so I I think that's why I'm okay with this so far. And I like a lot of where Magic's going. Some of it is is very broken, and I think that needs to be fixed. But uh, that's why I think I would just vote innovate. Like, just if I had to pick one, I'd choose innovation, just because I just don't ever want to go back to an Ixalan standard. I feel like we had in uh, Throne of Eldarine a pretty good example of like innovation that was balanced in Adventures. Like, I think Adventures are a fairly innovative mechanic. And they're still pretty balanced, and I think they they ended up being like relatively fun and healthy, yeah. like for standard and across formats. I think you could even argue that honestly, I think mutate is way more uh, innovative than companions, just in terms of like how the actual mechanics works. Oh yeah, uh, and and that has been, if anything, too underpower. Like maybe you could have powered it up slightly, but it, I think you would consider that balanced as well. Like it's been fun and limited. I've seen people have success with it and constructed, but it's certainly not breaking standard or any format. Yeah, I, I agree. So I think we have had like mechanics that have hit both marks recently. I definitely, I definitely think that like yeah, like mutate is great. Uh, I but because of the power level of the format, it do, you it does feel like it needs a bit of a boost. Like I think it could have. Totally just, the creature could have actually just added the stat of the creature at this point. <laughs> like, legitimately, because, like, what's the difference? It's going to get stolen anyways, right? <laughs> I, I can yeah, just imagine actually, Limited yeah. where you just stack the power, the game's over in turn four. But, but you see, <laughs> like, not, well. not if your opponent also has a massive creature, because then it's like, who has the bigger monster, right? <laughs> In a world where uh, Agent of Treachery is, like, the third most played creature in Standard, that might actually be a drawback. That might be yeah, powering, exactly. down, <laughs> powering down the mechanic if you combine <laughs> the power and toughness together. I, I will say, though, Mutate has kind of failed in that I don't feel like I'm creating a giant monster. Well, I I'm feel scared. like I'm creating, like, <laughs> a value engine, like... Like like Snapcaster Mage, right? Like you're you're two for one in your opponent, but you still just have like a four four or something, right? It's not this like oh you let me kind of mutate for three turns. Here's a thirty thirty trample, right? Like it's not it's not that Godzilla feel. That's um, what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. All right, next question. Next question. Inquiring minds want to know what is the largest tournament format that should be impacted. AKA cards in the set get played in, not that it necessarily warps the metagame by every standard legal set. <sighs> uh, that's a that's a really a really tough question for me. I I, I would like. say pi- pioneer for sure. I would also say modern mm-hmm. probably. I think after that, I I don't think I want like legacy and vintage shaken up by every standard set. And even modern, I'm like a little on the fence about. Like I want cards to be playable in modern from standard sets, but I I do feel like modern has maybe suffered a little bit by being shaken up too much by new cards recently, where it's making people uh, scared to buy into expensive modern decks because you don't know if the next set is just going to like completely invalidate your deck or print something that's so strong for your deck that it ends up getting banned and you lose your investment. So, uh, so I think my line is somewhere in that range. I, I want it to affect maybe like parts of modern. Like, I mean, that was my favorite thing to do back in modern, right? Like, like just jam standard cards. Uh, into into that into my deck and see what I can get away with. But nowadays it's just like, why wouldn't I, right? Because like everything in standard <laughs> is so good. It's like, cool, very very cool. You threw Uro in your deck. Turns out that's very good, right? <laughs> but like, I don't know. I I don't play enough legacy or legacy and vintage, so I can't speak on that. So, uh, but I do like it when there are cards in standard because I used to come. I don't know. Maybe it's a monkey's paw thing but like (laughs) i used to complain i'm like dude modern just does not get affected by standard and i am sad (laughs) and and now it happens every day so i i don't know i i guess i don't know if i really do want standard to affect modern as much anymore um i i like it when it affects pioneer but 
I don't know if I even wanted to hit modern. Yeah, I like it when it's combo or synergy based. Like, for example, let's say Splinter Twin was printed in standard, uh, the actual card, uh, and then it comboed with a card in modern, uh, you know, Deceiver X art. That is right. fine. What I don't like is when like a card just becomes a staple across the entire format, like say companions, right? Like every deck uses it. Uh, and then that's just the format now. So if it was like, okay, look, there's this like one card that now enables a collected company combo, then fine, yeah. right? That, I, yeah. I think that's great, right? But I don't like I don't like cards like Fatal Push, like like these cards oh, no, that no, just no, no, like <laughs> I, I actually just like. <laughs> so here's my Jund bias again, right? Like Fatal Push is also one of the reasons why Jund is no longer good, right? Because Jund's shtick is to kill creatures, but. Everyone can kill creatures nowadays, right? Like, it's not a thing anymore, right? Like, it's, it doesn't matter anymore. Uh, so, like, these... I don't know, like, these these staples, especially once you start going into the older formats, like, where you theoretically have the most broken cards of all time, like, Power 9, things like that, and then you're, like, upended by, like, Luris. You're like, what? <laughs> right? So, like... <laughs> Uh, but at some point you need new staples in the format, right? At some point you need to make that four, you know, four damage lightning bolt. At some point you need to make fatal push. Uh, but I just wish they were, you know, once every couple of years kind of deal, kind of like Snapcaster, uh, Delver. Maybe I'm too old, right? Like I'm okay with Delver changing legacy, or I'm okay with Snapcaster like warping modern. But for some reason I'm not okay with like Loris, or I'm not okay with. <laughs> Uro. I, I, I don't know. I think maybe that's just old man bias. I don't know anymore. <laughs> like, what's the difference? What's the difference? Like, Delver came in and, like, turned Legacy upside down, right? I mean, I I guess, yeah. But, like, it's it's such a fair card. I don't know. Like, I, I just don't. Companions I don't. are such a fair card, Krim. It's just a straight two for one. Like, there's nothing wrong. Would, You're not I comboing off. <laughs> I wouldn't say they're a fair card. And some of them are combo-centric, right? Like, It's so. a Snapcaster mage. <laughs> Yeah, like Snapcaster Rage, like a little higher up. I I would obviously look at Snapcaster as a lot more powerful of a card than Delver, though. And Fatal Push? What? (laughs) What? I I mean, I will say it is a little jarring if you just look at, like, our our list of most played cards in various formats. Like, in Modern right now, number one creature Loris, number two Uro, number four Ice Fang Coatl. So that's, like, three of the top five are creatures from the last year, and the top two are from the last, like, three months or something. And even with spells, you got, like, uh, Veil of Summer on there in the spell slot. Ether Gust is on there in the spell slot. And to some extent, the same uh, is true back to Legacy, especially for creatures where it's, like, Luris, Dreadhorde Arcanist, Goblin Crate Maker, Uro, Collector Oof. So I feel like... I feel like... Having those formats impacted by new cards is good, but I will say that, like, having half of the most played creatures in a format like Legacy be creatures that have been printed in the last, like, three sets or four sets, that is, that's probably too fast for a format like Legacy to move. I mean, yeah. So what's what's the alternative? Would you like to freeze Legacy, like a standard set? Let's say, like, a standard set comes and goes and, like, no changes to metagame? Standard Horizons? Nice, nice, <laughs> nice. We're going back to Standard Horizons. Let's go. <laughs> I mean, I think like having having. Jeez, I don't know. Maybe just like one are... card, or like maybe it's the rate. It's not the fact that these cards come into the format, but it's just like every set, like five cards comes in. Like maybe like every year, five cards comes in, and we would we'll be okay with it. <sighs> And it, and it might be more like, like how high they rank, I think. Like, I, I don't know if I like having all, so many new creatures be the literal best cards in the format. When I look at like, there's other new cards that are on the list, like Elvish Reclaimer is like 23rd on the most played list. Stuff like that, I think I'm, I'm kind of fine with where you're like powering up certain, uh, certain archetypes or they fit in certain decks. But I think what bothers me is like, the ultra staples, these cards that are like, oh, Loris goes in every single deck, or like, oh, Uro goes in a huge percentage of decks. So I think it's, I would rather have like cards that make a certain deck, like a certain deck gets improved and it sees a ton of play in that deck, but it doesn't see play in every, like Oko is a huge example of this. Like if there was an Oko deck in Legacy or Modern, uh, that would be fine. But when every deck is splashing for Oko, that's where for me it becomes like, less fun and exciting so i'd rather see archetype staples rather than like top card in the format staples showing up uh from new sets 
Was Oko a splash or was Simic just that good? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, though I agree with you, though, like, right? Like, I, I do think that, like, if there was just a, that one deck, right, that's fine, right? Like, that's why, I like, cards, like, like, I don't know, that one Arcbound Ravager deck. If Oko were just, like, an Arcbound Ravager in its deck, that's great. But, like, holy cow, right? Everything right now is crazy and, like, I mean... Like you had mentioned, there's like so many cards. It's just all of like 2019 magic. That's what it looks like, right? 2019, 2019 magic to now. And I never thought I would have seen a format like this. And maybe, maybe there, like, like Richard had mentioned, there are too many cards going in right now. What about a card like Astrolabe? Uh, that so is- in my opinion, Astrolabe is like one of the worst cards ever printed because it invalidates like entire archetypes. Like, nice blood moon or whatever like nice land destruction i have astrolabe right like it it kind of just like removes a pillar from the format uh and we we see this like you know wasteland decks and stuff like are, are going by the wayside and stuff in legacy like these things like just entire archetypes invalidated and from like two weeks ago I think Thoughtseize is invalidated now, right? Like, you know, you just remove this whole archetype from the format. So, like, what do you guys think of Astrolabe? Because it did enable, like, snow decks, right? It, it did bring a new deck, but it, it took kind of like an archetype with it. I, I don't know. Maybe maybe it's just because in the grand scheme of things, it doesn't see, like it doesn't seem bad to me at all. Like, I, I, I get it. Like, I get that you, you don't have to, like, worry about your mana sometimes. Like you, you've seen, like, four color snow decks and four stuff. Four color like snow. That. Yep. That's yep. the rage. Yep. Right. Like, so I'm just like, okay. But, but four color snow, once again, in, in modern, like, it's like, okay, sure. Right. Like, there's so many other things that I'm worried about in modern. <laughs> like, and four color snow is not on there. It does annoy me slightly that that i get it, like cards like i don't know blood moon don't really do anything against it like right like it's like the cool. natural enemy of four color decks yes. right right <laughs> like it's like yes very sweet blood moon i'm still going to make the mana that i want anyways right so like i get that part but i don't know maybe maybe it's just because of all the things around astrolabe right now make it seem like not even bad at all but i guess when you talk about it from just a normal like individually by itself eh. Yeah, I it's the fact that it there there is no drawback for playing it, right? And like and having the craziest mana base. I have to say I'm like I'm honestly surprised at how good it is. Like when I saw Astrolabe uh, and when it was spoiled in Modern Horizons, I did not at all think it was going to be a format defining card in formats like Legacy uh, in Modern. Like it, it's like one mana cheaper than a Prophetic Prism, and Prophetic Prism is basically like completely unplayable. Like no, no one does anything with it, and it's been around forever, and it's been fine. So uh, I'm surprised that it's so good. I do, I, I guess I, I don't like its impact on the format. I do think you can get to a point in formats where the mana is actually too good. Like you do need to be able to cast all your spells, but when you can just like play four or five colors with a pretty minimal cost, I think that actually ends up turning you into like battle for Zendikar standard where everyone's just playing like these piles of the best cards, which I think is actually less fun than if you have like some amount of restriction. So I'm surprised that Astrolabe has been as dominant as it is, but I think the formats would be better without it, honestly. Poor Wastelands. How much is Wasteland? Should I buy some Wastelands since no one plays it anymore? <laughs> it might It might be time. <laughs> I, I actually have a play set of Wastelands. So it doesn't matter. <laughs> uh, so any other any other thoughts on uh, these design questions and uh, so forth or... Is it a is it fish mail time? Uh, I got I got two kind of random tweets from Rosewater. I can't find the first one, but I did read it, so I'm gonna paraphrase it, <laughs> which is something along the lines of like, uh, why does it wizards devote more resources or get more resources to uh, play test these older formats? Right? We always say this, like you know, was it not obvious that as soon as you print this, modern would be broken, and basically mark's response is like if they could get more resources they wouldn't call it a shortage of resources right so read that however you will like it's like they don't have the budget or they can't find the people or whatever but uh you know they can't get more resources and that's why it's a shortage it's not like oh if they just want some they can get some they just cannot get some and then the other interesting question 
uh, was the only way uh, Mark Rosewater says, I'm the innovation guy. The only way I can help balance is by pushing less into unexplored space. I'm trying to get a sense from the audience if that's what they want. I put companions into Ikoria. Was I wrong to do so? So kind of similar to the first question. Was Mark Rosewater wrong for putting companions into Ikoria? Nope. I, 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 There's a f- I, I say, oh, go I, I'm going to say snap no because I never, I, I think that once again, innovation is great. If they mess up, sure, whatever, right? But like, I, I think that you like you should never. I, I think I'd, I, I would always rather have you explore undesigned, like you know, like uncharted waters, uh, putting new cards in, new ideas in. If it's broken, sure, I'm okay with that. Just ban it, do whatever you have to. Just don't be afraid to like or like hesitant to ban something. So I have a couple of thoughts on this. One is I don't think. I don't think the failing is Mark's with a lot of these recent cards. Like, uh, Mark, as he says, is like the innovation guy. He doesn't actually determine the mana costs and the power level of cards. If you read about the companion mechanic, they were originally like all mono colored and half of them were uncommons that were specifically just for limited. Uh, and then they got like massively powered up apparently once they left Mark's hand. So, uh, I think in general, it's uh, someone is failing to allow Okos and like once upon a times and companions and the incredibly long list of busted cards that have happened in the past year. Like someone's not doing something right. But my guess is it's got to be more on the like play design end of things. I don't want to like say them in specific, but s- somewhere someone should be like, Oh my God. Like Mark says, okay, we're going to make Oko. And then someone along the lines has to either be like, okay, this isn't good. We can't do it or balance it in a way where it is good. And I think that's where things are falling apart. Although with companions in specific, my second point is Mark tried this like very similar mechanic back in Tempest and knew it was a bad idea. I feel like, some of these like innovations, quote unquote, have you ever, have you ever bought a, like a deluxe edition album, like where <laughs> someone made an album 20 years ago yeah. and then 20 years later they do the deluxe edition and it has like bonus tracks and you listen to them and you realize, oh, it's like the, the cutting room floor stuff. Like these are the songs that 20 years ago when they made this classic album, they were like, oh, this isn't good enough to put on the album. So we're not going to include it. <laughs> and then it showed that like, I kind of feel like that's, that's happening a little bit with magic design where stuff that they knew like 20 years ago was a bad idea they're like circling back around to now and trying so i do think that mark deserves at least a little bit or uh bears a little bit of responsibility because he knew it was a bad idea 20 years ago and i haven't heard a good justification why he thought it would be different now i wonder if this really matters uh so like as tournament players we care do kitchen table players care or is companion the greatest thing they've ever seen uh, there, there's always this weird dichotomy with wizards of like trying to appease people playing at home casually. You know, they've never read a magic website. They don't net deck. You know, they just take whatever pile of cards they put put together and they play magic. I wonder if those people are happy with companions and people are still buying packs left and right. Like this all matters. Like how important is pro magic and kind of the tournament scene to the overall health of magic? It is definitely the most visible thing we see. And, you know, it's all over social media, but there are plenty of games that I play where I never read a single thing about it online. I have no idea what's going on. I just do my thing. I'm done with it. And that's it. So I wonder if like for the casual crowd, if companions are fine and if Ikoria sales numbers are good, like does this feedback really matter? That That is what I'm curious about, whether uh, pro players like us, this community has more sway than, say, the casual uh, the casual kitchen table crowd. I would say I'm, yeah. I'm full on casual now, and I love like 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 companions. So I, I don't know. <laughs> I I don't think you're. I mean, I don't think any of us can be that casual compared to like the I buy some packs at Walmart and play with them uh, on my yes. kitchen table. Like yes. compared yeah. to that level, like we're making contests, so we're not like that kind of casual by any extent. I would say like at the same time. I do think it's a good mechanic for that style of play. I think it's super fun. Like if you're incentive, I've even seen this in commander In commander, there's a high cost and your incentive is to do something cool rather than win. I think, uh, I think in those contexts, companion is a really, a really fun mechanic. It encourages people to build decks in different ways. So I do think that's very true at the same time. 
just ban them. Ban them for, like, there, there, there shouldn't have to be a choice because if you're so casual that you're playing with the cards you own in a companion deck on your kitchen table, you don't care if they ban them. <laughs> you're going to play what you want. You probably don't even know a ban list is a thing. So if <laughs> I don't think there has to be a disconnect there. Like, you can ban them for tournament play and people can still do whatever they want on their kitchen table because if you're that casual, you're not going to know the difference anyway. All right, last thing before we move on. 99.9% sure companions are being banned in some form or another. Otherwise, why would Mark Rosewater be talking trash about companions in public? What do you think is going to actually happen with companions? What What is the actual bannings that we'll see? Uh, standard? I don't know. Maybe maybe not for a bit. Not, maybe not till... Well, I, I was going to say until the next set, but I think that's pretty re- coming up, right? Like, I think in two months or so. But but I could definitely see Luris going in the older formats. Like Luris, I could see definitely leaving the the format. The like and then up next would be like maybe Yorion, but like Luris definitely. I think I think nothing probably changes in standard. If anything does change in standard, I think Yarion would be the top companion that people would be looking at. I think if you do want to make changes in standard, I would still go after like fires of invention. I think that's the, like the, <laughs> the, the card <laughs> that is most miserable in the format. Uh, I, I'm going to predict that they get rid of the entire mechanic in older formats. Uh, I think either by banned as companion, n- not necessarily banning the cards, but banning the mechanics. So you can still play them in your main decks or just outright banning them. I feel like the the tide has turned so far from older from competitive players in older formats and based on what we're hearing from like uh, Mark Rosewater and Wizards people not like hyping up the mechanic and actually sounding like oh my god we might have like messed up stuff with this one. I I'm predicting strong action. Uh so when you say older formats, how old are we talking? <laughs> Um, non-standard. Yeah. Okay. So, so modern blanket ban on companions as well. Yes, yeah. I see that. Yeah, I can see that happening. So, so clearly, like, say, let's take a look at, like, say, vintage. Like, lures is a problem. But if you ban lures, does the next companion prop up, right, and like take its spot, like eighth card? Why not, right? So it's a fairly risky proposition, and I feel. You kind of alienated these players from the older formats so much already by like screwing with their formats so much over the past year or two that probably a blanket ban is like a nice safety measure. And if, you know, some cool deck goes because of it, then so be it. But I I do feel like legacy players and vintage players are kind of like on their last legs with like these formats due to like just how they've been treated over the past couple months slash years. So yeah, maybe just blanket ban. I think they'd be fine if they were not companions. What do you think about that idea? Like, we've I, never actually seen them oh, ban a mechanic such a before. Complicated well, thing. <laughs> they, but they have kind of like banned like cycles, right? Like, I mean, like they banned the cycle of like artifact lands, right? So that's true. that's true. So like, it'd just be the same way. Like, it'd just be okay, cool. Well, just no companions. Well, what do you think about banning that? Like, banning them from being used as a companion, but leaving them legal for main decks, basically. I, I like you think that's just fine. erasing the companion text. I, I think that's fine, right? Like, I mean, w- would it still be a problem then? I don't know. I mean, no, I don't think I don't, so. I I don't think any of them would be. I mean, Loris would probably still be good as a main deck card, but I don't think any of them would be broken as main deck cards. Yeah, like I don't think it'd be any more powerful than the rest of the stuff going on in the format, right? So, uh, like, yeah, like I I think they could totally do that. That's. Uh, like just making it so that they they can't use the mechanic. Like the, there shouldn't be anything in your companion zone ever. <laughs> like okay. Oh, and so honestly, for standard, though, <laughs> and I'm pretty fine with it for standard. Like standard rotates. Like that. Yeah. That's always been my concern. Is like, I just I I can't imagine looking back at a companion every match in like modern five years from now. Like I I don't know I don't know if I would enjoy that experience. So that's always been my concern is the older formats because. Honestly, companions, even if they're busted, even Yarion or whatever, Karuga, are they really that much worse than, like, Nissa or Teferi or Fires of Invention or other cards that we've lived with for a run-through standard? I don't think so. I don't think they're, they're considerably more obnoxious than that in standard, even though I, like, strongly dislike the just the design of the mechanic. Whatever. Like, standard's always going to have cards that people complain about. Yeah, like Nissa. <laughs> Krim's still complaining about Nissa, even though no one plays it anymore. 
<laughs> it's like that's my, why Krim likes companions because companions pushed out Nissa. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> we now we now know <laughs> Nissa where haven't seen one in days. Love it. <laughs> All right, let's move on to fish mail. So if you have questions, send them to at MTG Goldfish with the hashtag MTG Fish Mail, and we get to your questions on air. So first question, Mister Shiny Object from email. I know people keep telling you to make a deck with every companion and you keep saying it's impossible because some companions have restrictions that are contradictory and you can't have more than one companion. So I thought about it. (laughs) Your deck is all lands. Here's the question. If you were allowed multiple companions, would a 17 card hand and a deck with all lands be the top of the meta? So this is not how it works. You can only select one companion, right? You can't select multiple companions. Is that true? Uh, You can only have one each game, yes. Okay, but if the rules were changed so that you could select any number of available companions (laughs) that were legal, 17 (laughs) card hand, just all lands. Would you... Is this good? No. (laughs) What is is Zerda do? (laughs) I bet you'd win a game with it once in a while. I don't don't think it would... I don't think it would be good, but I bet you... Like, if you played a bunch of games with it, like an Against Odds episode, I bet you could get a win eventually. But but we're talking like you're playing 17-card hand that's always revealed, right? Because they would all be in your companions. (laughs) But I mean, just the curve. Just the curve of, like, something, something... Garuda could probably win you the game, right? Like, I mean, you, like three drop, four drop, well, some crap, and then Garuda would probably get you there in a game eventually. Maybe because Garuda would pull something useful from your exactly. opponent's deck. <laughs> not, <laughs> not the lands from your deck, but from your opponent's deck. And then you can Yarion to blink Garuda and get something else from Maybe that deck actually would be busted. No, <laughs> <laughs> oh, no it is not. <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, next question. Wajosa. <laughs> I don't know if that's pronounced right. I think there's one mythic on a twenty on a hundred twenty one card sheet. So you need to open an average of four eighty four packs and spend two thousand dollars to get a playset of a standard mythic without MTG finance. Thus, MTG finance is making the game cheaper. Thoughts? I don't think that's what uh, MTG finance is. That's the secondary market we're referring to, right? Basically, this person is saying if you had to buy cards the wizard's way, which is just sealed product, it would cost you a fortune to get anything. So you need to buy cards from card stores, which is a secondary market. Is the secondary market equals equals MTG finance? I I guess. I mean, I guess it depends on how you define MTG finance. Technically, a very broad definition, I guess, would include anyone who is selling magic cards. I, I think the way people mostly use the term is. Uh, MTG Finance is, I think, mostly used to refer to, like, speculators and individual people who are, like, playing the stock market aspect of Magic, trying to buy cards and hope they go up in price and resell them. Uh, I don't really consider, uh, you know, vendors in local game stores to be part of MTG Finance uh, in the same way. But I think that, I mean, if you do, then that's true. Like, if you only could get cards by, just look at Magic Arena, if you could only get your cards by opening booster packs, it would be a lot more expensive, especially with booster packs being $4 a piece in paper. But I don't know if it's fair to lump local game stores in to the same group as uh, like stock market style speculators. Yeah, and it's arena without wild cards, by the way. Yeah. Uh, Sir Man Yortis, what do you think about a white enchantment that reads each opponent can't have more than one land enter the battlefield each turn? Growth Spiral laughs at this, but it could be an interesting space to explore. Yeah, I'd be fine with that. I mean, I don't know if it'd be very good. <laughs> Maybe you'd play as like sideboard tech against ramp, but. Yeah, I don't think that's, like, overpowered. I think that would be a, a fine card to print. Yeah, I mean, it has to be, like, a ley line or something, right? Like, you have to get it down pretty fast before your opponent starts, like, casting their arboreal grazers and, like, getting ahead of you. <laughs> <laughs> before they cast their arboreal grazers. <laughs> oh, it, it no! It needs to be a companion. It needs to be a companion that's a zero drop. That's what we need. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's... I never thought Uh, I'd I'd hear that sentence. We got to get it down before the arboreal (laughs) grazers hit. (laughs) Corel, what do you think about wizards embracing quality of life bans at rotation, banning top cards during rotation if they would continue to be defining post-rotation? 
uh, like Fires or Embercleave. I would think doing this at rotation would take the sting off of the banning. <laughs> banning at rotation? Yeah, so it doesn't, so like, the card, say the card doesn't rotate. It's going right. to actually pass rotation, but at that time, you ban uh, like the, the best cards so that people, basically, so you know that if you're playing Jeskai Fires at rotation, even if your card is not rotating, you're at risk for a ban so that you can plan for it. So kind of like making some cards rotate a year early, basically. More or less. Just, like, have them yeah. rotate out with everything that's naturally rotating. Uh, I mean, sure, I guess. <laughs> I don't know if that, like, is that better than just how we have normally been doing bannings? I guess if it was something the community accepted and you knew, like, every rotation... I mean, you could even announce it, like, three months ahead of time. Like, hey, we're rotating Fires of Invention early. Like, keep <laughs> that in mind over the summer. <laughs> yeah, like, that That sounds like it's just still getting banned, right? Like, like, it, it, it basically is, yeah. So, I don't... I don't know, I, I guess, like, is that... Yeah, like, is that better than the, the format that we have now? I do kind of... I will say I do kind of miss having, like, dates. I think it's, like, weird to have to watch... <laughs> Every week, like, oh, are they going to announce the banning announcement today and then have it come and go? Like, I, I kind of miss having set dates once in a while to look forward to for BNR announcements. But I don't know if doing it in rotation has a huge upside over just banning it randomly throughout the year like we do now. Yeah. Yeah. I, it's 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 tough. I, I, I still want to see them switch to, like, a ratting card somehow. I don't know how they would do it, but... They can't have this digital game and then this paper game at the same time and try to move at the same pace. So you're going to have bandings left and right, or you can do what every other card game does and just like change the card itself. But oh, having man. paper kind of screws this all up. Yeah, like like if they just eroded cards, the paper half would be too brutal, right? Like it's like, well, I what I'm buying today, does it actually do what it says on this card here? Uh, but what's the alternative? The alternative is getting banned left and right or broken metagames, so... I, that's why I guess I'm okay. I'm okay with the bannings. Like, like, I guess. Cause I don't know. It, it would feel real bad if I were like getting into the game and I just, you know, my card does not do what it says it does. Cause I was already pretty irritated with that when I, I played like, there's a card game, uh, like, I think, what was it Force of Will that I tried? It was like a, like a JRPG kind of card game, I think. And I bought some, I bought a, like a deck, right? And I was like, okay, well, my deck's gonna be sweet. And then I played, I played like a little local tournament. It's like, wow, none of my cards like do what they were supposed to. <laughs> I'm like, <"It's> sick. <laughs> <laughs> All right, True Cross seventy seven. Seth thinks people will stop playing if the game is too consistent, out of boredom. Have you ever watched Pokemon TCG? The decks are built so much around cards that make them very consistent, and it is still thriving. Po Pokemon playing Pokemon that was like playing Storm though. Every deck was Storm. It was, like, that was actually how it played. But, I mean, maybe it changed since the last time I played, so. Uh, I know nothing about Pokemon or how it's played. I've never I've never watched or played a single game in my life, so. Crim well, Crim's <laughs> description was pretty accurate the last time I played. You basically, like, see your whole deck and you, like, wheel yourself, like, multiple times. It's, like, yeah. turn one, by the way. Yeah. And then you win. And then I know they've made various rule changes uh, to stop this from happening. Like, you can't wheel on the first turn. Uh, if you go first, which is weird, right? But yeah. uh, there's something to be said about the depth of Pokemon TCG. I feel, I, I so I don't know enough at a high level, but I feel magic is way more complex. Uh, and part of it is the consistency and like the number of cards and what you're doing in that game. Uh, and it does get boring, right? There's only so many times you can like storm off by yourself uh, before <laughs> you're like, okay, I'm done. Like I, I have figured this out. Uh, your opponent can't interact. Uh, there's no alternate game plans. It's like, eh. Like Magic is a much bigger game than Pokemon TCG. Uh, so I, I don't know if that's an apt comparison. Yeah, I, uh, I would say that the games differ a bit too much there. Yeah, like, but but if I were to put it simply. Uh, for those that don't know, it is really just like draw your deck. Just keep yeah. drawing. Go all your spells. Like discard your hand, draw seven. Discard your hand, draw seven. Right, and you try. They they've made it so like you can only play like one supporter a turn and stuff like that. Right, but yeah, like it, it's it, a lot of the decks just play like a storm deck. 
If you like drawing cards, Seth, you should try it. You yeah, draw lots of cards. That's gonna you just know. full time maybe, right now. Maybe, <laughs> maybe I'll yeah put together a Pokemon deck. That does sound. Because <laughs> one thing I learned was like drawing cards is not always good. Like I'm yeah. from Magic, so I'm like, oh, I better draw cards. Like eight for one, my opponent. And then I just deck myself. I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> we shouldn't just keep drawing cards because you can. Right? I mean, you, you have you have land destruction, right? You, like you like blood. You just blow up their energies. That's like the same thing. <laughs> All right, Rap Shonen. Would Lightning Bolt be fair and standard? <laughs> Currently, yeah. Why not? <laughs> let's let's make it happen. No, I I I genuinely think that there are some cards that are are like okay right now, and like I wouldn't say Lightning Bolt's on there, but I would think Lightning Strike is fine, right? Well, Lightning Strike's always been fine. Like when was right. it not fine and standard? <laughs> well, recently they've shifted away from it. I'd be a little worried about right? Abash. Abash Lightning Bolt. I think it's just randomly not been in standard lately. I don't know if it's like a choice that they think it's overpowered as much as they've just printed like other various burn spells. So I would expect Lightning Strike is still on like the approved list. I think Lightning Bolt Abash yeah. would not be the right standard for Lightning Bolt, but I do think I do think that Lightning Bolt is of a power level where it could be in standard. As long yeah. as you don't have something that obviously breaks it. And I, I kind of like Land and War Elves. Like, if there's the right reason to put it in standard, I think it's fine to give it a run for, you know, for a year or whatever through standard. But I would want to be careful about what support cards there were. Like, if you put Lightning Bolt into a standard that has a broken mono red deck with like Abashes and Torbrands and Torbrands <laughs> like then then maybe it would be something people disliked but like also I guess like lightning bolt going into standard though does mean like a good amount of creatures like I kind of get checked right like kind of like the reason why we couldn't have four mana board wipes for for a little bit like they had to push it to five because apparently it validated too many four drops right <laughs> <laughs> I mean, every every creature in standard does something when it enters the battle. Like, what, are you going to bolt my Age of Treachery? Like, sure, you got me. You got my, you got my X3. <laughs> but, but like, outside of, like, Age of Treachery, I guess that again, what other creatures are being played in standard outside of that? Like, Uro? <laughs> so... Yeah, I wonder, just because so many creatures, like Kenrith and Cavaliers and Yarions and Earls, like, <laughs> yeah. a lot of the best creatures just do something right away and don't really care that much about Bolt. Yeah. <laughs> so maybe creatures have gotten so good that Bolt would be fine. Yeah, cool. I guess you hate out the one mono red and, like, mono white player, right? Like, you got him, <laughs> right? Like, because, <laughs> like, Cat doesn't care, right? Cat just, like, all right. Yeah. I'll sack it. <laughs> you can get their, like, serrated scorpion and take two. Like, charge <laughs> yeah. yourself. Pay one, to discard a card, take two. <laughs> uh, next question. Timothy, recently you were talking about how hard ramp is to punish in Standard and Pioneer. I propose an effect like balance would solve this. Thoughts? I... Yeah. Yes. Yes. Give me... <laughs> I oh, would yes. want that. Yes. Oh, <laughs> How would you make balance? <laughs> balance, like it says it in so, the name. <laughs> <laughs> like the way it's supposed to be played, I think is perfectly reasonable. But the way you end up playing with it is like always broken, <laughs> right? Well, so like, how do we add a restriction to make it work the way it's supposed to work? Well, okay, the standard break it though. Like, specifically the cards in standard right now? I mean, you can always break it, right? Like, you just mull the three and then, like, do nothing and then balance. I do that anyways. And then play so. your <laughs> companion and then kill him. Like, I, I don't know, right? Like, there's always things you can do to make the balance not symmetrical. Mull, mull to, to, like, three. Play Kahira from the companion zone. <laughs> win will slam balance win the game. But, like, if your opponent's doing that, I guess it's... I don't know, like... Is is that broken? I I don't know. I, I guess it is. I guess it is pretty broken. Yeah, <laughs> but I, I I mean, I think maybe like cataclysm might be like fair ish balance, like something something like that. I, I where it like puts everyone instead of going to like the lowest number, it just puts everyone down to one of something. Kind of like the the Mardu snap decks, like whatever uh, uh, card mythos. we got, but it hits lands too. Yeah, yeah. What about just Armageddon? 
<laughs> I like Armageddon. <laughs> yeah, dude. Like, it shuts off fires unless they're loaded with zero drops. <laughs> like, we, we can't even uh, get stone rain and y'all are going to go for go right for Armageddon. Yeah, like, how, about <laughs> fixed, how about fixed Armageddon? Like, four mana, destroy all lands. Your opponent can return two lands from the graveyard to the battlefield. Yeah. It's like asymmetrical balance where... They get some lands, you get no lands, but theoretically you've built up an advantage to overcome this. Just a, how about just a smaller fall of Thran? <laughs> just d- destroy all lands you control. <laughs> <laughs> we got him. I don't think that was the half I was looking for. <laughs> but like, like a like a legitimately destroy all lands and the be like you know kind of like the saga thing. You can make it just like. I don't know, small of Thran, I guess. Like, the, the thing here is you just blow up all lands and at the beginning or whatever, whenever a saga would trigger, main phase one, whatever, after your draw step, you get two lands and put it back into play. Each yeah. player. Like, I, I like just, like, I think Fall of Thran would have been great, just not at six mana, right? I, I mean, I, I do, I do like the idea, but I don't know. I need to play, like, some progressive games. I, I keep sticking, like, go back, like, oh, yes, Ernam Jin Armageddon. Like, this is the glory <laughs> days of magic. But I'm like, that's probably a terrible experience, right? I mean, yeah. Uh, but that's but why I, how do you, you got to punish ramp decks. I, I just, yeah, I, just like ramp decks going crazy and there's nothing you can do about it. I mean, have you seen people flipping out about Agent of Treachery? Yeah. Like, <laughs> how much people hate that card? Could you imagine, like, if you just literally could destroy all your opponent's lands on turn four, I can't imagine that would go over well with like but they the would get two arena back. crowd. But they would get I, two back. I, I don't even know if that would save it for him. <laughs> I think I think we do need ways to punish ramp, but I think it's more likely yeah. to be like mana barbs or even the white enchantment that was like you can only play one land each turn. Like I think that they do need ways to punish it. I would be surprised if they actually went with land destruction. I would enjoy it, but I think we would have endless complaints uh, <laughs> from I mean, I, from arena players. I would like to see ramp players make a decision about their ramp. Like, aggro players don't just spill all the creatures on the board, walk into a Wrath of God, and like, oh, you right. got me, right? Like, you actually have to hold back. Same with, like, every other player, except ramp players. They just freely play out their <laughs> ramp spells with, like, no repercussions. <laughs> and then their payoffs, like, can't be countered, right? It's like, feel the dead. You're like, oh, I can't deal with this, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, like, if there was a fairer land destruction, there could be a thought of like i need to hold back this land uh for whatever reason i need to not play this right now for whatever reason so if they can make a card to make ramp players play the same game as every other magic player which is like not dump all your resources and then like get eight for one right yeah Uh, whatever that card is i don't know what it is we're not game designers it's not armageddon but right hopefully they, they do something so that you don't just spill all your cards on the battlefield and call it a day. <laughs> still still saying, once again, price of progression, right? Totally in white. <laughs> the opponent takes five damage for each land yeah, they have more they than just, you. They, they just play basic lands with Astrolabe and you're like, cool. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. I just mean lands. <laughs> like every land they have more than you, they take five. Oh, oh there's even more progress on the yeah, progress. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's it's <laughs> price of progress, cool, but price of progression different <laughs> and in white all right i think that's all the fish mail we have time for this week thank you for everyone who sent in fish mail if you have questions send them to at mtg goldfish with the hashtag mtg fish mail and we'll get to your questions on air and i believe that brings us to the end of episode 276 of the mtg goldfish podcast so richard Grimm, thanks for hanging out thanks to everyone for listening thanks to spikes academy for supporting the show and on that note we'll be back next week to talk about whatever goes down in the world of magic so until then this is the crew signing out 